Higher, higher, higher. Yeah, so the pheromones can properly circulate. Yeah. Quint, I'm pretty sure like the, the way you're supposed to do this is actually with a t-shirt. And also, I'm, I'm quite sure that this doesn't actually work. Hi, everybody. Matt and I are having some ladies over tonight, and we're going to play this. Troy's is a 2011 game of victory points and the nobles who love them. Two to four players each control powerful families spanning the 400 years it took the city to build the Cathedral of Troy's, which I think puts in perspective us taking four years to launch a merchandise shop. Now, this is a German-style game, meaning that players won't be fighting directly and will instead be snatching dice, representing the city's workforce, out from under one another and squeezing these pliant serfs into buildings and projects that may or may not earn you prestige and or bankruptcy. Now, stop what you're about to do. I think you're going to hear that and you're going to see this box which has all the sex appeal of a custard cream and you're going to go, you know what, I actually left my coat in the other... YouTube video. Well, no, you didn't. I'm on to you. Stop, because this game is actually fantastic. Originally released in 2010, this game has stood the test of time for seven years, which in the myopic world of board games makes it almost a classic. Uh, so stick with us as we tell you why that is. Are you sure that Americans know what custard creams are? Look, America has custard creams in niche areas. You shouldn't put custard creams in niche areas. <laughs> Don't do it, kids. Yeah. As with other exciting Euro games, Troy's lets you strike out in a number of directions in the hope of doing good. Maybe you'll invest heavily in the army, or get a career in industry, or maybe you'll like build a cathedral and, and hang out and suck up to the bishop. That sounds like you, doesn't it? That sounds like the sort of thing that you do. But you'll have to delay your dabbling in these three areas because we have professions to think about. Not only are professions in Troy's randomised, they're also teased very slowly throughout the game at the start of each round. Like, oh, Mr. Chivalry, or oh, an artisan, or ooh, a priest. You don't have to make those noises if you're playing at home. You do. The way these cards are slowly revealed throughout the game gives both Troy's the game and each individual game of Troy's a kind of brilliant freshness. It's like huffing on an air freshener. But just like huffing air freshener, it's also going to give you a headache because when everything's out on the board and everything's there, there's going to be something, whether it's gold or influence or priest, something is going to be in demand and you're just gonna have to work around that. But before you can think about that, you're gonna need dice. As seen here on the board, Troy's is a big medieval pie sliced up into these segments that each player owns. But everyone's got their own slice of pie, and while it starts off very smooth, with everyone having equal amounts of dice at the start of the game, apart from the kind of AI, computery, non-existent player who gets what's left over, as the game goes on, the pie gets a little bit less fair and even. Because these dice, which are effectively your workers at the start of each turn, well, other players can give you gold to just take the good numbered dice that they want and spend them on their turn instead of yours without your permission, which is tricky. And also on their turn, people can put their other kind of placement people into your building slots so that next turn they get the dice from your pool instead of you. And after a while, this pie becomes very unfair, very mixed, and everyone's eating each other's pie slices, and it's just a crazy medieval pie party. I thought you needed that as a visual prop for the... to explain the... That pie was really expensive, man. So at the start of a round of Troys, all players are going to roll their dice pool depending on which buildings their workers are in. So I'm going to do that now. And then you start, ooh, there's high numbers. Then you're going to take turns building dice pools, going round and round, each of you snapping one, two, or three dice of the same color out and using those pips to do something. So on my first turn of the game, I might send these red sixes of mine, the soldiers, out to the city to go and defeat some skirmishes. That's going to give me some influence. Now, then maybe I take buy a yellow dice from someone else, which costs me money, but I can make more money from the artisan, turning that influence into gold. And then maybe I'll end my turn taking these white dice, training someone as a priest, putting a man on this card, and then turning those white pips into mysterious priest cubes 
that later I can parlay into additions to my yellow. So if you've ever played a worker placement game like Agricola or Lords of Waterdeep, you're going to realize that this is way more flexible and strange than the simple act of, I've got three workers, I want this and this. No, in this you can use any number of dice if you have the money. You don't have to use your own dice if you've got the money. So what is the value of money? What is the value of putting people into buildings to get more dice in future rounds? What we're saying is that nothing about choice is familiar and nothing is complicated, but it all feels fresh. Like a glass of chilled champagne from the Champagne region of France, where this game is set. That segue is <laughs> like a fox. Money is power in Troy's. Money mainly gained from yellow cards and yellow dice allows you to basically just keep buying other players' dice like a massive pain in the Troy's hole. But there's one thing you can't do with a dice that you've bought from another player, and that's re-rolling it. The second kind of economy in this game, alongside money, is influence. Now, influence allows you to spend one influence to re-roll one of your dice as many times as you want providing you've got the influence to spend. And not only that, you can actually take three dice of yours and spend four influence to flip them all to the other side, turning a bad hand of dice into some super shiny shiners. Of course, if you've actually got the influence to spend and you don't want those greedy coin boys snapping up all of your dice before you get a chance to use them, you can actually spend your influence to make your bad, your good dice bad so that no one else will want them and then make them good again. Like That seems crazy, but it's a crazy game. I weirdly found Troy's reminded me an awful lot of Lords of Vegas. If you've got loads of money, you can just end up spending it frivolously on other people's things and bleeding the money around the table. Or if you want to push your luck, you can just keep re-rolling dice again and again and again until you're on the edge of disaster, just because you can then pull something off that might be amazing. And finally, even the area control works in a vaguely similar way. If you really take the time to dominate one of these building types, then it takes the other players a really concerted effort over time to actually boot you out of it and get that control back. It's fine, they just buy your dice. So what have we got so far then? We've got money, which is useful for buying dice. We've got dice you can affect by having influence. You can also just have more dice. And someone around the table is gonna be dominating each of these areas, but, in case you haven't noticed, all of this stuff is literally pointless. And that takes us to what is so fun about Troy's because the actual victory point cards show up throughout the game. Building a cathedral is always okay. Dealing with the armies outside France, that's quite good. And then also at the, by turn three, you'll finally flip over these cards that reveal, ah, oh, okay, we can get victory points for hosting banquets for the red dice in one person's sector. Or, ooh, the journeyman is gonna let us turn money into victory points at game end. But you don't know. And uh, so Troy's is about uh, scrabbling for victory points when they show up really quite early, which makes it unusual for a German style game. And it also makes it a hustle. From turn one, someone's bankrupt. Someone has no dice. Someone has spent all of their money training someone how to be a chivalric knight and then gone, oh, I can't use that. And for want of a better word, you are living from day to day, making mistakes and thrilling not just at the very end when you count up all your points and your engine works, but every single turn. You invest and then you rip a hole in your plans and then you've got nothing and then you look for some other avenue of attack. It's reactive as opposed to just sitting and plotting. And that is a lot of fun. Another great thing, most games of this caliber will shrink the board to deal with multiple players so that you have a similar experience with multiple people. Troy does the bizarre step of just not doing that, you play with exactly the same size city, same cathedral, same number of cards, same slots on the cards, same events, if you're playing with two or four. So what was it like playing with two? It was... Well, with two, it was like the game was shorter, but we had way more dice, way more control, and you could completely dominate an area and be rolling out huge yep, you, amounts of you money. You can all be on every single card, perfect. But with four players, die... <laughs> Like, you'd have all, half your dice being bought before you'd even taken a turn. Yeah, sometimes you'd be like, that's brilliant, I've rolled all these sixes, but actually you realised in one player, like two players, you know, you roll high numbers, great, but with lots of people rolling loads of high numbers, it was just bad because everyone would eat them. And then if you didn't, you could use that money to buy them back, but it's not what you want. Right, so this is the thing. You play choice with two, and then Matt and I went, oh, we got to play this with four. You play with four, and it's like, oh, it's good with three. You play it with three, perfect. And then you think... Remember when we were kids and we used to play Troy with two players? Ah, we should do that again. Those, those were days. That's the thing. Games that where you finish them, you want to play them again, are fantastic value for money. That's the most... What was that? The ladies are here. No. 
nice. Introducing the ladies of Troy's. Do you want some champagne? Oh, I'd love some. I'd love some. <laughs> You'll have to excuse him. He thinks he's staying. So this expansion actually adds five modules, but ladies first. Ladies of Troy's gives each player a purple dice, a lady to be rolled and then used as a red, white, or yellow. You know what that means. These ladies are wild. Whoa. Whoa. What, is, what does that mean? It means a greater degree of tactical stability. How did we get women to marry us? I don't know. Unlike every other Tom, Dick and David in town, these ladies cannot be bought, which means every player has at least one dice in their pool that cannot be bought by any other player, fundamentally changing the game. And like everything else in Troy's, it's a very simple thing, but it's something that definitely gives you a lot more to think about and things to work with. Another optional module that the expansion adds lets you send a man for a run around the walls dropping fatty cubes on things that let you augment actions on the main board, an addition to the base game that lets you use any number on any dice as if you were just playing a classic board game. I'll just use that four to move the man four spaces. This effectively adds an element of fuzz for experts to navigate, since now with every dice you have to ask if it should go to the walls, and more vexingly, when should you do it? Ladies of Troy's also adds a load of new events to be shuffled into the base game's decks. Otherwise known as stuff that goes wrong in France. Yes, and most importantly, it adds as many professions that are in the base game again. So now you can approach the final furlong of the game and suddenly it's nuns. Quick, everybody, when using nuns or herbalist cap cap cat capital. It's probably going to be nuns. It's probably going to be nuns. Um, overall, I think Ladies of Troy's, Matt probably agrees with me, is an absolutely fantastic expansion. It adds uh, nothing it adds should be in the base game, which is what we're mm. looking for. None of the modules it adds are bad. They're all interesting, they're all good. It expands the lifespan of the original game. And uh, if you are playing with Troy's experts or Troy spurts like Matt and myself, you can add the modules that give it more depth. Still, with or without the ladies, Troy's is an unusually dynamic and aggressive little Euro game trapped in the body of a dead history teacher. But Shut Up and Sit Down does recommend Troy's. Absolutely. Even the art style grew on us as we played, this kind of wood carving aesthetic. The fact that the colours in the game are very much muted on the board, allowing everything else to just pop. It's clean, readable. Simple. It's something that is in contrast to a lot of the design in modern games, which are often very textured and detail heavy, or super chunky, super colourful, super basic and simple. And the, and the characters, these, these drawn characters in oh, the traditional lovely. style, that kind of faintly wonky humans, <laughs> that it's just the, the art style of the era. It just all functions as a whole, you know? Yeah. Overall, uh, Troy's is uh, a really strong, fun game that plays with half the rules explanation and half the time of so many big heavy engine building games that are coming out and that necessity to adapt rather mm. than plot and scheme is tons of fun just fantastic uh, but the only problem is that means that Troy's has some tough company mm. it's got Orléans uh, which we have a review of on the site and uh, Istanbul and Concordia all fantastic games jostling for your pocket money as much as Troy's so what would you say if I was to say to you which is better, this or Orléans? We can't answer that because Matt and I haven't played Orléans, but I want to fix that. I've put in an order online for Orléans. We're going to play it, so we'll be able to answer that question in future and on podcasts and stuff. Okay, well, what would you say if I was to ask you, is Troy's better than Concordia? Oh, Concordia is the better game, I think. Do you mm. think? Yeah, it plays two to five as well. That is really quite good. I think Concordia just edges out Troy's. If you haven't bought both of those games, I'd do Concordia first. And what would you say if I was to ask you if it's better than Istanbul? Ooh. Why, if you asked me that, I'd probably just leave. I just, it's easier, isn't it? Leave. Yeah. 
bar. Oh, I actually just, excuse me, sorry. I'm just going to. How does he usually f finish these videos? Quins, how do you finish these?